Hello and welcome to the first in a nine part series on the World War II liberation of Negros Island. Everyone remembers MacArthur's famous and staged landings at Leyte. Many people remember the assault on Corregidor Island, but few people remember that the campaign to recapture uh, the Visayas and Negros in particular was long and difficult and bloody. In this series, we're going to tour the island and take a look at what's left of the landing sites, battlegrounds, strategic inf infrastructure and memorials as we go around and we'll be presenting you with some archive footage from the campaign on this island by these protagonists, not just some generic World War II Pacific uh, footage. This story is based on the work of John D. Reynolds, Bill Calhoun and Lou Akins. Without them, we wouldn't have been able to put the chronology of these events together. Those works are linked in the description below and this video should be viewed as a companion to those works rather than the other way around. At the end of the series we'll cover not only the surrenders but also the ultimate fates of some of the surrenderers and we'll have uh, some new and exclusive information about a war criminal who was captured on this island. In this episode we're going to take an overview of the legal situation uh, in the Philippines and the steps that were taken to pave the way for landings. MacArthur's Allied forces had landed on the island of Leyte on the 20th of October 1944. The Japanese were willing to stake much on the battle for Leyte, diverting some 45,000 troops from other garrisons in the Philippines to reinforce their defense of the island. The American victory in Leyte was thus a decisive blow that loosened their grip on the neighboring islands. As combat ops on Leyte entered the mopping up stage, MacArthur had sent his invasion forces to Luzon in January 1945, which was the start of a massive ground campaign that would continue right until the end of the war. Even with that huge effort underway, he did not ignore or try to skip over the southern islands. Within a month of invading Luzon, MacArthur began the effort to liberate the remaining Philippine islands. It is still somewhat of a mystery how and whence General of the Army Douglas MacArthur derived his authority to use United States forces to liberate one Philippine island after another. As island theatre commander in the Southwest Pacific, he felt he had a right to employ the forces at his command as he thought best for the common cause. So wrote eminent naval historian Samuel Elliott Morrison. Today we're going to focus on just one of MacArthur's commands, that of Lieutenant General Robert L. Eichelberger's 8th Army, part of which was assisting Lieutenant General Kruger on Luzon. The remainder of this force was now going to be directed at the thousands of smaller isles which together constituted the bulk of the archipelago. At the extreme south was Mindanao, the second largest island in the Philippines, and all the major islands lying between Mindanao and Luzon, including Bohol, Cebu, Negros and Panay, which are collectively known as the Visayas. Outside of this, you also had the Sulu Archipelago and Palawan. All of this presented a daunting mix of mangrove swamps, ravines, scarred mountains covered in dense jungle that could be thousands of feet high, and all offered perfect cover and high ground to a defensive force. Enemy garrisons were everywhere, but mostly concentrated around ports and small Lying in wait for Eichelberger was the Japanese 35th Army, then commanded by Lieutenant General Sasaku Suzuki. His troops numbered approximately 100,000, but they were scattered throughout the 8th Army's area of operations, and his crack combat troops were down to only around 30,000. Suzuki's best defenses were at Cebu City, on the Zamboanga Peninsula and around Davao City in southern Mindanao. 
most of the Japanese garrisons were both undermanned and ill-equipped, but did not expect to engage in large pitched battles with US Army forces. They instead expected to be bypassed and left alone until the end of the war, whichever way that went. Three days after elements of Kruger's 6th Army entered Manila on February 6, 1945, General MacArthur issued the first order for operations in the southern Philippines, codenamed Victor, which was a plan comprising four parts. The four parts were numbered in the order in which they were to be carried out, although that's not the actual order in which they took place. Victor III was launched again Puerto Princesa on February 28th after weeks of bombardment. At the same time, Victor IV was launched against the Zamboanga Peninsula. Victor I comprised the 40th Infantry Division, a California National Guard unit, veterans of the Luzon Campaign, and the 503rd Parachute Regiment in reserve. They were assigned the targets of Panay Island and the northwest of Negros Island. The main unit assigned uh, to the liberation of this island was the 40th Americal Division. And they were given the following tasks. First, to seize and secure a beachhead at Pulapandan and advance to Bacalod and secure that town and its airfield. Upon securing Bacalod and its airfield, they were to advance to Silai and capture and secure that town and airfield. Having achieved those objectives, they were to proceed to the north and northeast and destroy the enemy in those areas. Finally, to destroy the remaining hostile forces left on Negros. <laughs> 